Hello, everyone, and welcome. You are listening to Dispatches, conversations about getting through the COVID crisis with community care, mutual aid, and personal and collective resilience. You are tuning into part two of my conversation with Zephyr Elise and Julianne Gale. If you haven't heard part one, it's a fantastic conversation where Zephyr and Julianne talk about the lessons they learned from Standing Rock that are serving them today during the COVID crisis. Zephyr Elise is a mixed Indigenous two-spirit filmmaker, liberation activist, guest on Skokomish Territories, founder of Mason County Climate Justice, soil regenerator, and gluten-free chef and baker. Julianne Gale is a youth worker and a community organizer committed to complete liberation for all people and a just transition in the face of climate crisis. I'm your host, Becca Tilson. I'm an organizer and a movement baby, a somatics practitioner, a facilitator, and a mother living in Duwamish Territory, otherwise known as Seattle. We started this podcast in the tradition of our community organizing ancestors who taught us that we need each other and that we have each other, and that even in these unprecedented times, we collectively do have what it takes to meet this moment with creativity, love, and grit. I'm wondering if either of you have any ideas about what you think we could create here that hasn't been possible before and what we can do within these constraints. What is that little dream we're dreaming right now? For me, it cycles back to my ancestral traditions. Leave it better than you found it and always grow and create something. And that something for me is healthy soil. It's food. It's medicine. It's making sure that when I leave this earth, I've done my best to caretake whatever tiny little space I've been granted to help. I don't like to say I'm a farmer. I like to say I'm a plant tender. I like to say I'm in solidarity with the biological workers under the ground because those millions and trillions of beings are way more important to life on this planet than my one revolution in this current body for this time. Growth happens under our feet. Carbon sequestration can happen under our feet. And in doing that, we can produce a bounty. We can produce the healthy, nutrient-dense food that is needed in all our community. And I'm lucky to be in a more rural area where people are a little more focused on a healthy ecology. But we're still facing a disconnect where people kind of only see it to the surface of the soil and not subsoil. And kind of we're pushing toward healthier waterways, but we're not understanding how soil is actually part of our water system. And the healthier we can get the soil, the more we can withstand forest fires and have resiliency and and store groundwater where it needs to be and also be able to grow and eat as as two leggings that need the bounty of this earth to live on. And in the way that I was taught and in the way I'm relearning, you know, 30, almost 40 years after my grandfather told me these principles feed the soil, grow things to feed the soil. It's not about using the dirt as the thing that holds the plant up but and actually that is where that connection of sun and water and grandmother earth come together to give life again to us you know and here in this rural county we also take care of each other and we look to each other and we understand that we do have to help each other out we are not in an urban area We have lots of of land to grow things, but we also have lots of community that checks in on each other, that still knows how to wave, you know, kind of like at Standing Rock. Everybody knew how to say good morning. I go back to the big open areas and everybody's so trying to just be present in whatever they're dealing with, whether it's a Facebook, whether it's social media, whether it's their job, whether it's walking the dog or kids or trying to pay the rent or just survive, right? And it's such a disconnect between this really big scheme of life and how we're all part of the circle. And I think anybody can grow wherever they are. I've, I've lived in big cities. I've lived you know, in college apartments. Even if you have a windowsill, you can grow something. If that's not your thing, maybe you're just growing some dirt or you're recognizing that every organic thing that you're creating in your waste can go to grow soil and you're taking that extra initiative to make sure it's not going to trash to make sure it's not going to anywhere other than where it needs to be which is regenerating so some of the possibilities that i'm seeing already being suggested or already happening 
I'm seeing a lot of young adults that are moving home to be with their parents or their families or that people are choosing who they want to face this with. And I think that will have a big impact if people stay with communities longer rather than spreading out. I dream of this slower pace of life being more the norm. I know that's not true for all of the communities. Like I'm sure healthcare workers and grocery store workers and truckers are not experiencing that yet, but I would like them to get to experience that too. I think this is a good time for a Green New Deal or just transition or regenerative economy to really take off because we're making decisions about what is and isn't essential right now. I know a lot of construction workers are a little confused that their work is being seen as essential when what they're doing is building an office and not a hospital. But I think there's a collective shift in consciousness towards a deeper understanding of what is actually essential in the world we want to live in. I think that there's a lot of possibility for practicing the kind of very quick changes that we need to address the climate crisis. And just by traveling less and by less production happening right now, there's already a reduction in carbon emissions. There's already an improvement in water health. There's already an improvement in air quality. And I think there's a possibility for even more to happen. And also I read something recently about the idea of the military being taken over by civilians to be able to be used for hospitals and the resources of the military being moved towards healing instead of towards destruction. And that is a really cool possibility. And it would be even cooler if it remained after this pandemic too. So Zephyr, I understand that you are a gardener, a plant tender, and that this is what you do for most of every day. Is that right? Pretty much most of my life since my grandpa first toddled me out when I could stand and hold the seed or carry some water. It's what I've been doing in season, wherever oh. I've been, anywhere I've been, everywhere I've been. I try to grow something, yeah. So what are you growing right now? Right now, I'm growing a dream of feeding my community. <laughs> We're renters. We don't own the land. I've been trying to do a lot of container gardening. I started out with hay bales like three seasons ago, trying to figure out how renters and folks in urban areas could think about gardening in contained compact low ways. And also because we're in a beautiful territory that has problems with pollution in the water, which are causing problems with salmon and orca and the greater ecosystems at large. I'm trying to think about really just regenerative, healthy ways of doing everything. And we're cold. We're almost a thousand feet up. So it's been an experiment. And this year with getting the negative test, it just seemed like a green light to really now think about what am I going to provide? So I'm building hugel culture beds, which is a fancy way of saying take any woody debris, any kind of organic debris that you have, whether it's logs, sticks, twigs, down trees, whatever you can scoop. And you're just going to build this beautiful bed that ultimately over the years will take in enough water that it doesn't need to be watered after the second or third year. Uh, it's going to be warmer for the growing season because of the compost. Like you layer after that other leaves, clippings, compost, and then a nice little topping of soil on top and then mulch it over because we don't leave soil bare. It's really bad for the biological workers. You got to cover them up. And over time, it becomes kind of a self-heating, early heating, longer growing season and self-watering, regulating system that grows really nutrient-rich, full plants. And you can maximize your space that way, kind of put it anywhere, whether it's for shade plants, whether it's for herb mounds. And I've been putting in a lot of raised beds and along with that thinking that food forest, we can't just think about perennials. We have to think about grains. We have to think about nuts. We have to think about other ways to get stuff like vitamin C than maybe an orange that's flying halfway around the world. So we were really lucky. A relative who does food forest advocacy and has actually planted a lot of food forests between Portland and Mason County donated a bunch of fruit trees and some elderberry and some shrubs and companion plants 
So we're just basically kind of putting in on a tiny little two-tenth of an acre lot as much food as we can to feed ourselves, but also to feed the deer and to feed the birds and to feed our neighbors and to feed, you know, whatever community, because who knows what the stores are going to look like, you know, if this goes long term, but this is what I can do. I can grow both the perennials, I can grow spring and winter varieties, really thinking about what we eat. So it doesn't matter if kale grows here, if nobody's going to eat 20 pounds of kale a day. Like, <laughs> So, you know, the potatoes are going in, the beans, definitely upping beans. If you're in urban spaces, if you have a tiny little Trader Joe's like plasticized bag, you can grow some potatoes, you know, even if it's a handful of offcuts from when you're peeling, like anybody can grow a little bit of food wherever they find themselves. And this year just happens to be a year I'm really amping up pollinator food. So think about feeding the birds and the bees that are also going to help with this food cycle. So it gets to be medicinal, lots of edibles, and it's just... Uh, the dream was to really start growing 80% of our food each year, kind of amping it up. And now it's just more out of necessity that I really need to think about what is the maximum amount of food that can grow on this little postage stamp that I have here. So you were getting there, but I wonder if you have any specific tips for those of us who are really new. You know, I am a very novice gardener. I had a tiny garden where I tried to grow tomatoes and basil last year. Um, And I find it really intimidating and a lot of people do too. So I'm wondering if you've got any tips for how to break into it, especially given the stress and the circumstances of this moment. How does it make sense for somebody to get their hands in the dirt? The beautiful thing about being a seed tender is the seed itself has thousands and thousands and thousands of ancestors that know what to do. And it can pretty much figure itself out as long as you give it just a little bit of love and a little bit of attention, you can make it together. So taking that stress off and just remembering we're not launching a rocket into space. This isn't coming up with a cure for COVID. This is sprouting a bean or growing a corn. A lot of plants just really want to grow. Think about potatoes in your refrigerator drawer that you forgot about for five months. They're going to grow great. And you have done nothing more than had the good sense to put them in a paper bag, right? And forget about them. So thinking that the soil also is part of what you're growing. You're not digging a hole to put a seed in. You're giving that love. You're giving that care. You're thinking about it growing and feeding you and you helping to feed it we all are making waste right now we don't know what trash and recycling service is going to look like long term but that all grows good and it does it by itself you know there's ways to compost healthier for urban space versus rural space but pretty much so long as you're gathering any organic anything that was living and putting them together it's going to grow something that you can grow stuff with And right now, you know, community gardens might be good places where if we can't be together, they're often resources for seed libraries and for manuals. A lot of them are still open to give people time to come through. If you don't have any knowledge, they're a great place to start. And there's so, so, so many boards right now, it seems, on Facebook and other social media. Amazing places if you're, you know, having the woes and want to curl up in bed, you know, maybe reading some blogs. And if not, find me on Facebook, y'all. I'll answer a question or two. I can answer that question from a beginner standpoint. I like to joke that I'm a toddler when it comes to gardening because this is my third year of really doing that. And to just give you a sense of how much of a beginner I am, I was like, well, if we're growing food, why are we planting flowers? Because I didn't realize that to get fruit like squashes, for example, you need pollinators who need things like flowers. And that's how disconnected I grew up from the soil and from growing things. So I'm really, really new at this. And I also went to college for computer science. So when you're computer programming, you have to be very precise about things. That's not how gardening works. When the seed packet says plant half an inch down, three inches apart, you're not taking out a ruler 
you're doing the best you can and you drop a seed where you didn't mean to drop a seed and then it grows later and is the strongest plant out of all of them. It's fine. Like you just get to try and keep trying and perfection is really not the goal. So I just had a thought when you said that. Though, what if our movement culture could both embody the fierceness of our analysis and our high standards and also embody a little bit of that permission and grace that you just drop a seed and you might drop it in the wrong place and it might grow up to be the strongest one. Absolutely. I think there has to be a lot more space for beginners, both in gardening and also in movement spaces. Yeah. I mean, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to create something massive. So, Julianne, I wonder what you're doing besides toddler gardening. And if it's that, great. You can t- say more or not. Julianne, I'm wondering what you're doing these days to access resilience, resource, to ground yourself. I'm experimenting with scheduling as little as possible so that I can actually check in with the rhythm of the world and my own rhythm so that if it's not raining, I can do more outside without really heavy, wet soil. I'm trying to say hello to the deer visiting the yard and planting things. There are very, very few Jews and very, very few Chinese people who live in this county. And uh, as the two groups that, as far as I can tell, are currently getting blamed for coronavirus, it's really hard to be a Chinese Jew right now. So finding ways to connect with other Chinese Jews is really good. I was on a call with all Chinese and Southeast Asian heritage co-counselors, and there were like 27 of us, which is a small subset of our community in the co-counseling world. But that was more Asian people that I'd been with at once in months and months and months and months. And so that was really good for me. I don't know, Z, is there anything else I'm doing right now? You're cooking amazing food, and you're getting into the rhythms of not productivity, but just what needs doing as it needs doing. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting balance to be like, how do I think ahead and how do I be here and now? And I think a huge part of that is finding the joy in the moment. Like what a gift that I get to be involved in planting this year because my job under normal circumstances is so overwhelming. I didn't think I would be able to do any planting at all this year. So I get to enjoy that gift even as I grieve the deaths and the suffering that are here and are coming. Thank you both so much. So in closing, I'd like to ask if there's anything else you'd like to share with everybody listening. Um, A resource that I would recommend is Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal. I read it before I saw my grandmother after she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in August before I saw her in October. And there's a level of peace that I got from it. I think that death is actually a very normal part of life and that it's important. And there's a pressure in mainstream society to live forever and to never think about death and to never die. And even in my Reconstructionist temple, on the High Holy Days, I was reading a little footnote that was like, You know, the traditional words are about thanking God for life and also thanking God for death. But in most modern Reconstructionist prayer books, you take out the thanking God for death part. And I was like, actually, I think that's a mistake. I think we do have to thank God for death because death leads to new growth and is really there. And so figuring out what is the kind of death that we want to have for ourselves and for our loved ones and what do our loved ones want, particularly our elders, And how do we figure out how to be with them from our hearts when we can't even be with them with our bodies is really key. Our songs and our dances, our medicine. And for those of us who don't know our songs or our dances, occasionally we're gifted a song. So I was gifted the hummingbird song from Kay and Sayers Roots, registered member of the Indian Canyon Band with the Ohlone Nations down in Hollister, California. And Hummingbird is one of their creators. They have co-creators, Hummingbird and Claire. And this, to me, is a song we used to sing walking around the Bay Area and laying down some prayer and having some hope. 
and offering that back to Creator because it is all a cycle over and over again. I am not a lonely, but I am grateful to be able to sing this song and share in a good way. Omunya, 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 we Omunya, 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 we we Omunya, 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 we we Omunya, 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 we we all oh, my relations. Oh. Thank you both so much. It was such an extreme pleasure to talk with you, and I hope you both get a lot of rest. That concludes part two of my conversation with Julianne and Zephyr. If you haven't heard part one yet, I hope you go listen to it. It's a really wonderful conversation where they talk about lessons learned from Standing Rock. Thank you for tuning into Dispatches. We want to dedicate today's episode to Bill Withers. Rest in power, Bill Withers, who died on March 30th of this year. We can't play licensed music here, but since so many of us are finding refuge in music, maybe you'll consider playing one of his songs like Grandma's Hands, Ain't No Sunshine, or A Lovely Day. If you have an idea of a story that dispatchers should cover, go to our website and fill out the form. We're always looking for ideas. Dispatches is a Kitchen Dance Party production. Producers are myself, Becca Tilson, Basil Shadid, and Molly Tilson. Today's episode was edited by Justin Minnick. On the editing team, we also have Jill Irene Friedberg, Basil Shadid, and myself. Many thanks to all our friends and supporters. Please rate and review us. Please tell your friends about us. And until next time, remember that we need each other and we have each other.